All right, looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's debate on evolution. I have Dr. Kent Hoven and Ryan Adler here with me for this important debate. This is a continuation in our 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge series. Now, before we get into the opening statements, let's get a couple of short introductions from the debaters tonight. So firstly, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. And also thanks for giving us your time for this evolution on trial debate. Ryan, why don't we start with you? Been a little while since you've been here, a month or so. A um, little bit about yourself, how you doing today, and a little bit about your YouTube channel. Yeah, um, I'm doing good. Uh, my voice might sound a little rough. Lost my voice the past few days, but um, basically not much to know. I'm from Ohio. I you know, have a family and stuff. But other than that, I'm not an expert in any of any scientific field whatsoever. Uh, I did go to college, but that wasn't for anything pertaining to evolution. And yeah, I, I ain't got much. My YouTube channel, it, I like to cover what I consider misinformation. Uh, obviously, I've covered Mr. Hovind a few times, usually on things pertaining to the age of the earth. But other than that, I just cover pretty much anything. I'll play games on there too. I mean, I'm not, I just make what I want to make. I just like making stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan, I appreciate the intro. I do have your YouTube channel linked in the description box Thank for you. people who want to check that out. So with that, uh, Kent, good to have you back as well, brother. How have you been? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about Dal. Well, thank you. I've been great. God's been good. Some of God's kids drive me nuts, but God's good. Uh, he's got a strange family, brother. Uh, my name's Kent Hovind. I've been a Baptist preacher 48 years. I taught high school science and math for 15 years, and I do a lot of videos on science in the Bible. I'm glad Ryan's working on uh, misinformation because there's so much misinformation to teach the evolution theory. I got a video number four, Lies in the Textbooks. Uh, there's over 30 lies that they use to teach kids they believe, you know, in evolution. If you have evidence, show it to me. But meanwhile, don't lie to them. They talk about the stupid geologic column, which does not exist anywhere. They talk about the fossil record, which is no such thing. And there's just no such thing as evolution. It doesn't happen. It's all imagination. So glad you want to work on misinformation, Ryan. I'll help you on that one. Anyway, we have a Christian campground and science center and museum here in Lenox, Alabama. Good luck finding that on the map. Straight north of Pensacola, 70 miles. And we have visitors from all over the place. Visitors last this week from, let's see, China and uh, Ukraine, and people, just, I give tours every day, love it. People come from all over. So come on down, Ryan, we'll give you a tour of the place. All right, Kent, thank you so much for that introduction. I've also got all of uh, Kent's relevant links in the description box as well, as well as a playlist and a link to our website and the YouTube channel where we've got all our evolution debates from this year in this uh, evolution debate challenge series. You'll find about 50 to enjoy. So with that, again, to Ryan and Kent, thanks so much for the intros. And we're just going to get right into it. So for the audience sake, it's going to be an easygoing debate. It's going to be relatively informal, free flowing, lots of back and forth. And uh, we will start off with 10 minute opening statements, though. That way we can kind of set the foundation, lay out the arguments that we will be discussing. So, Ryan, with that, we're going to hand it to you. And uh, you've got, let's say, roughly 10 minutes and then we'll go from there. So whenever you're ready, Ryan, the floor is yours. Yeah, <clears throat> sounds good. Um, I'll try not to take the full 10 minutes since we obviously started just a tad bit late. But other than that, so I know I need to give some points for him to go off of. So I'll just give one easy one that he likes to talk about a lot. Fossils, the geological strata, the different layers, the fact that you won't find certain fossils within certain layers because logically you would assume they're age-based. He does not. Um, and obviously fossils are a good way to learn about evolution, all the different variations of a kind or species or whatever you want to use. Um, but other than that, I just want to say he, you're going to hear a lot of some extraordinary claims and talking points from my, I guess, competitor or whatever here. He, you're, you're going to hear you know, dogs don't produce dogs and cows don't produce cows and all this stuff that has nothing to do with evolution. And 
at the same time, at least last time, he was fully okay with admitting evolution happens. Uh, things evolve, you know, language evolves, society can evolve. As something as simple as a car or cell phones can evolve. But for some reason, life can't, according to him. I, I don't really understand it. I don't get what that thought process is, but hopefully we'll learn a little bit about that tonight and be able to discuss it. But other than that, I'm just, I appreciate having me here and listening to my horrendously raspy voice right now. Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to keep this nice and brief so we can get into discussion. So I'll just turn it over to Kent. All right, Ryan, thank you so much for that opening statement, those opening arguments. And to the audience, I do want to uh, remind them this is round two. There are some people in the live chat saying this debate looked familiar. So we are live. It is round two between Kent and Ryan. Round one was about a month or two ago. And so uh, also, if you have any questions in the audience, we will be having an audience Q&A. Please just make sure to tag me either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth. And that way I'll be able to save them. So, Kent, we're going to hand it over to you now. And whenever you're ready, we'll say up to 10 minutes. Uh, whatever you don't use, we'll put into the uh, discussion portion. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Ryan. I'll try to cut, keep it down as short as I can, too. Um, you mentioned uh, the, why are certain animals found in certain layers. The whole entire misunderstanding uh, of this geologic column, which does not exist anywhere in the world except in the textbook and in the imagination, is the, the, the wild idea somebody came up with in 1830 is that the layers form this way and the top layer is younger. Where's the top layer coming from? How can it be younger? Are these layers coming from outer space? All the layers of the earth formed sideways as the current's moving back and forth. We covered that, uh, what, last Wednesday was it, Randall? On uh, Whack an Atheist, I give video, video footage showing the layers forming horizontally in moving water. See, the Earth, uh, I can't find my Earth here. Wow, that's pretty bad when you lose the whole world. There we go. Okay. Uh, the moon is pulling the water up on the Earth, making a bump called the high tide. It holds the bump like a magnet. The Earth spins under it. So the tide, people on Earth get to see the tide go up and down. The moon never sees that. If the tide's going up and down, it's also going in and out of that bump. If the Earth were covered in water, like the Bible says it was during Noah's flood, then the tide would not have interruptions like it does now by banging into continents. So the tide would become harmonic and be about a 200 foot tidal change. Right now, the Bay of Fundy in Alaska has got a, Canada has a tidal change sometimes up to 100 feet. Typically tides change five or six feet around the world, but there are a few spots like Anchorage, Alaska and stuff like that where it's 30 or 40 feet. But if we had a 200 foot tidal change all the time, the water going up and down is pumping in and out. It's the sideways movement of the water during Noah's flood that formed all the layers. Uh, this is what the guys just absolutely don't get, and I don't understand how to explain it any other way, but the entire theory of evolution is built on the false assumption that the layers are different ages and their stupid geologic column, which does not exist anywhere. It's made up. All over the world, petrified trees are standing up, connecting all the layers. I don't know how long a dead tree stands around in Ohio. I'm from Illinois, but down here in you know, Alabama, you get four or five years. They're about done. Okay, So if all the layers formed in one year, like the Bible would indicate, well, then, yeah, you could easily have petrified trees in the standing position running through all the layers. So why are certain fossils found in certain layers? Why are all the reptiles found in the same one? Well, they have the same body density. Uh, I think the birds will generally be found on top because birds are lighter than clams. And so they're going to be found on top. This whole geologic column does not exist. This is the Bible to the atheists. I fully understand they will fight tooth and nail to say things like, well, all geologists believe it, as if that means something. There have been thousands of times through history where everybody believed something that was wrong. How many Germans followed Adolf Hitler? Did 55 million Germans follow Hitler mean he was right? How about 80 million or 90 million people followed uh, Stalin during World War II? Does that mean it was true? How about all the people today in communist China thinking, oh, communism's good. Yeah, you better think that. It'll cut your head off. It, this, this whole idea that because everybody believes something makes, it makes it true is ridiculous. First place, not everybody believes it. Secondly, if everybody did believe it, it still wouldn't make it true. The fact is there are petrified trees in the standing position all over the world. There is no such thing as a geologic column. It is not even common sense 101 to say the top layer is younger. Where did it come from? 
If I shuffle a deck of cards, is the top card younger because I shuffled him? Moving it from here to here or here to here doesn't make it a different age. So what they do, though, they date the fossils that they find in these layers by which layer they came from. Send a fossil to any university and say, how old is this? They will say, where'd you find it? What difference does it make where I found it? Oh, it makes a big difference. We have to know where you found it to know what layer it came from, to know which, if it's you know, Cenozoic or Mesozoic or Paleozoic or Jurassic or Triassic or Mississippian. What difference? Just how old is it? Where did you find it? I found it in the dirt, okay? Where, now, where is it? How old is it? But see, they date the fossils by the layers. And then they turn around and date the layers by the fossils. They assume evolution has happened. They start, I use the word farm, F-A-R-M. It went from fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. They say, well, we know fish evolved to amphibians, and amphibians evolved to reptiles, and reptiles evolved to mammals, and then birds. You don't know any such thing. But they've already arranged the, animal, the animals in order the way they want them to evolve. And then they date the fossils by which layers they come from and date the layers by which fossils are found in them. There is no such thing as a geologic column. There is no such thing as a fossil record. Those are baloney. No fossils are forming today. How many animals died in the last 24 hours in the world, would you guess? Millions? How many are going to fossilize? None. It takes very special conditions like Noah's flood would provide. The flood, the Bible says the scoffers in the last days would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood and the coming judgment of God. The flood explains it all. Just north of me in central Alabama, there's a coal mine with several layers of coal. They dig out a layer of coal, dig through the overburden, dig another layer of coal out. They mine that stuff constantly, I think 24-7, digging coal out of the ground. Hundreds of petrified trees have been found running through the seams of coal. Here's a big tree right on top of a seam of coal. Where's the roots? This thing all happened in a flood, all of it. The layers, they have the Mary Lee and the Blue Creek formation. A friend of mine's a, a foreman up there in the coal mine. He said, Brother Holman, you dig up petrified trees standing up all the time. He said, if you put together the samples, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it's quite obvious. Sample H goes up through the Mary Lee layer coal, and A goes through the Blue Creek. But they're both going through this center layer. Hello, a freshman law student could win that one in court. Your Honor, both of these, all these layers formed before the tree could rot. That's for sure. I'd say less than a couple of years. Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone, Wyoming, 27 consecutive layers with petrified trees standing up. 30-foot petrified tree, Cookville, Tennessee. I'm going there in a couple of weeks. Cookville. The top and the bottom are in different coal seams. But the evolutionists date these coal seams at vastly different ages. They think a forest grows, gets buried in a flood, turns to coal, a whole bunch of more layers form on top over thousands of years, and then a whole new forest grows, it gets smashed and turns to coal. 27 consecutive layers of coal. That's a lot of smashing and regrowing. And yet there's no, uh, no evidence for that at all. And the coal layers are nearly always, the petrified tree, the coal always seems to be on top of clay, very poor base for trees to grow in. we got clay all over our gravel pit here. So my contention is we go to Joggins, Nova Scotia, and see all the petrified trees standing up. I'm sorry, Ryan, your entire religion of evolution is built on the phony assumption that the layers are different ages, which is just plain logically not possible. If the top layer is younger, where did it come from? Outer space? You guys think the Earth is getting layers on top, you know, like, I don't understand. There is no geologic column. There is no such thing as a fossil record. When you find fossils in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't know it had any children. You sure don't know it had different children. And petrified clams in the closed position are found by the millions up in Cookville, where I'm going, probably maybe even this week. There's a whole 10-foot thick layer of petrified clams. Millions of them. It goes for miles. Closed. When a clam dies, it opens. They find petrified closed clams on top of Mount Everest. But see, the Bible says the scoffers are ignorant of the creation and the flood. Ryan, the flood formed all the layers in one year. The layers formed sideways. Watch, uh, by the way, our YouTube channel's in YouTube jail for a few more days. But they can still watch stuff. We just can't add comments or delete some of the idiot comments. But... Uh, the, go to uh, where I did the uh, Whack an Atheist last Wednesday and look that one up. Where I show video footage of layers forming horizontally. 
the tide, tidal pumping going in and out would do that in one year. So my contention is there is no such thing as a geologic column. All the fossils would have formed rapidly during the flood of Noah or because of the flood of Noah. If an animal isn't buried quickly under the right conditions, it won't fossilize. So I think the whole evolution theory is built on a complete lie that the earth is billions of years old and the layers are different ages. Absolutely not true. Prove me wrong. Go ahead. Okay. Dr. Dino, thank you so much for that opening statement and uh, the opening arguments from the both of you, Ryan and Kent. To the live chat, thank you so much for tagging me. We've already got several excellent questions already. So with that, we are going to jump into the discussion portion. We'll make this as free-flowing and yet equally timed as possible. Of course, I'll moderate as needed. Kent just ended with his opening statement, Ryan. So why don't we allow you to pick the first topic and we'll go from there. So with that, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> went over a lot there, but you, you know, most part about fossils and the flood. So if the flood happened and buried all these whatever creatures and trees and everything else and created fossils. So by that assumption, you're saying that what I would consider the oldest possible farthest down layer of creatures and the very top were living at the same time? Oh, absolutely, yes. There are still clams alive today, and there are clams found at the bottom of the geologic column. There are still birds alive today, and they're found at the top, generally. Yeah. I mean, nearly all the animals that you guys use as fo index fossils are still alive today. So yes, everything lived at the same time. The world was destroyed. Some animals have gone extinct. I understand that. But yes, my answer, a uh, short answer is all the animals in the geologic column, uh, which in your imaginary geologic column, all formed, lived at the same time. If there's any sorting, it might be by habitat. You know, buffalo are going to be found together because they hang out together. They might not be found with, you know, coyotes because they don't like coyotes around them. So there could be some sorting based upon habitat, based on intelligence, based upon mobility, based upon body density. A lot of factors would sort things automatically in a flood, just like this thing. Automatically just sorts into layers every time we tip it over. It makes a bunch of layers. Happens rapidly. But yes, my, you, correct. Short answer, yes. I think all the animals were alive at the same time. Okay. Um, so if that's true, and this flood happened, and the entirety of the earth was covered in water, salt water for the most part, uh, all the trees should be dead. And if that's the case, why do we have trees today that are older than when this flood should have happened? Okay, you're basing on the assumption that it was salt water. We, I no, uh, entire... real quick, sorry to interrupt, but actually I'm basing it on a tree you covered in one of your videos. Not you personally, I was, uh, yeah. I don't remember his name, but anyway, yeah, so. Well, I believe the flood was all fresh water. We do know that the oceans are getting saltier every day. If you watch my video number one of my series, I go through 30 different evidences that the earth cannot be billions of years old. One of them is the measured known salinity increase in the oceans. All the rivers are running into the oceans and they're bringing with them mineral salts. Evaporation only takes out the water, leaves the salts behind. We know the oceans are getting saltier. We know they average 3.6% now, so some in you know, different differences throughout the ocean, but roughly 3.6%. And we know that could all be done in less than a few thousand years. So if the whole world was fresh water, Noah wouldn't have to bring water on the ark, throw a bucket overboard. But also, all the, uh, salt water wouldn't be a problem for killing all the trees. I think the flood was fresh water all over, nearly all over. There may have been some pockets of salt water. But uh, the, then it becomes saltier since the flood. And I think the evidence indicates the oceans are less than, well, 4,400 years would be the Bible date. And that could easily be done. Uh, with just a salinity increase. I could call that slide up if you'd like, but watch my video number one, right? Show all the evidence of that, the salinity of the ocean. As far as the trees surviving, trees can survive a flood just fine, especially floating log mats, giant log mats the size of Texas would be floating around. And when they land, and sometimes I think the flood in some parts of the world might've only been a few weeks. It wouldn't take long to drown everybody. The fact that Noah was in the ark for a year has nothing to do with how long the flood lasted in Lenox, Alabama. The crust of the earth floating up and down during a flood, it was all, the crust was broken up. Some parts might have been inundated for a while and then exposed and then inundated again if the crust is flexing. Uh, the, we know the crust is cracked all over the place uh, with fault lines everywhere. So I think that 
the, the when, I, when you get to heaven, I'll get the video and try to explain it to you about the, the, what happened actually. But my theory would be that the earth was all fresh water and it's become saltier ever since. Go ahead. Uh, what about the creatures that can only live in salt water that were alive back then? Well, there are saltwater creatures today that also have freshwater counterparts. There are saltwater bass, freshwater bass, saltwater crocodiles, freshwater crocodiles. I think some animals have adapted to salt water. Most of them, most of them don't like it. Most of them have to get ways of getting the salt out. Some of them put salt crystals out their eyes, some in their urine. But salt is generally a nuisance to the animals. <clears throat> now, some may have become totally dependent on it. But going from a freshwater crocodile to a saltwater crocodile is a really minor change compared to going from a rock to a crocodile, which your religion teaches. No, it doesn't. Evolution does not teach that at all, actually, but <clears throat> that's beside the point. Well, it doesn't. It's just there's very gradual changes. The issue is, is what I'm trying to get at here, is the age of the earth thing. That's that's the biggest issue you have with evolution. It's the only reason it doesn't work. I mean, you still believe in a form of evolution. You even admitted to me that things do evolve. You just don't, for some reason, like to say life evolves, even though it would have to because there was only a certain amount of animals left after this flood, and now there's everything we have today. So you still believe in a form of evolution, but regardless, the, the biggest, the crust of the issue here is the age of the earth. That's why I keep coming back to it. And it's just, I, I'm just trying to figure out how, how people believe this. It's, it's boggling to me. Like I just don't <clears throat> understand it. Okay. Well, two things, as far as the definition of evolution, you said, I believe in a form of evolution. This is the whole problem. You have to define the word. What do you mean? And I show many, many times in my seminar, there are six different meanings. Number six is off the screen here right now. You have to no, start one. Off. Things evolve. That's all you need. Okay. Well, then you're referring to variations within the same kind called microevolution. No, micro -evolution. I'm, not, I'm just referring to things evolve, everything, not just life. Everything well, evolves. Then, then the word evolve is too slippery. What do you mean? Do you mean well, just like the word mean, kind? <laughs> okay. Well, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. If they can bring forth, they're the same kind. There are now 4,000 varieties of potatoes. Some have been developed over the years by natural or artificial selection to live in saltier soil. Some live in, you know, more damp soil. Some live in dry climates, cold climates. Some taste sweeter, sweet potatoes. You know, there's 4,000 varieties of potatoes. I think they probably had a common ancestor called a potato. But you guys want to think the potato and the banana and the human had a common ancestor. Ryan, do you believe over millions of generations, you are related to a potato? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All life is related. Absolutely. I mean, that's simple, though. But the problem is, that's the biggest problem, is that in your belief, you just don't have enough time. And I, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. I mean, you're just wrong. But regardless, and, and the thing is, you're basing it off of a book written by people thousands of years ago. But anyway, even if this flood happened, um, the, where's, there's no proof or evidence for it at all, other than making some things up and the reason we go with all the scientists you mentioned in your little intro um it, it's not saying that it's all the scientists but it's above you know 90 some percent of them that's that's more than enough to be considered a majority that's a very major majority and, and that's how the world works with everything i mean that's how we define society essentially how we figure out moral reasons and laws to deal with stuff is usually majorities but anyway, right. and, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, what you got four topics on the table now. I'm trying to go one at a time. Uh, the fact that a majority believes something, A, does not ever make it true. You should know that. Otherwise, science could not progress at all. There wouldn't be no scientific discoveries when they discover, yeah. oh, wow. Now, in 1830, the majority of scientists believed the Earth was only 6,000 years old because the Bible dates add up to about 6,000. Was the majority of scientists wrong then and they're right now? Or were they right then and they're wrong now? Okay, so right there. Um, no, they didn't. But even if a majority of them did believe that, yeah, they are wrong because that's the point of science. It it does evolve and the wrong they answers don't. get put out and you, you get it. more correct ones. But here's the difference. Being now, once again, no, it was not the majority back then, but being wrong by a small percentage or by even halfway is a lot less than being wrong by 100 percent, like claiming the world's only 6000 years old. That's big difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's cover some of the previous, you got, like I said, four topics on the table. Um, as far as, uh, let's see, the age of the earth, of course, is absolutely essential. 
you guys have to have billions of years to turn your frog to a prince. Because your, fa your, your fairy tale of evolution shows very clearly to the kids, I'll show you here, that all the animals, a family tree, you believe that all these creatures came from a single cell creature like an amoeba, a protozoa, a bacteria, something like that. The human, the bird, the reptile, the ladybug, the pine tree, and the worm all had a common ancestor. This is what the books teach. What we've observed is there are now several hundred varieties of ladybugs. I agree. There's a lot of different varieties of humans. Some have darker skin, some lighter skin, some blonde hair, red hair, brown hair. There's a lot of varieties of humans, but they're still human. They're still interfertile. There's a lot of varieties of ladybugs, but they're still ladybugs. This is a science. Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. We can see this happen, okay? But you want to believe ladybugs and humans are related if we go back to a common answer, and there's no such thing. This isn't science. You left science. But all the books say all the many forms of life are related. And you make up these family trees, and this is essential that you have billions of years for the fairy tale to look reasonable. This isn't science. We've observed sharks produce sharks. That's all we've observed. But you want to draw a line and connect a shark to a fern and a starfish and an octopus and say they're related. You want to think an amoeba, protozoa, in this case, turned to a biology teacher. This is from the public school textbooks. I have hundreds of them. I object to them using the observable evidence of variations within the kind to make the kids believe that it goes forever. This is baloney. How's the marijuana? Oh, it's just uh, nicotine. But oh, okay. uh, not that there would be an issue with the marijuana. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't mind some right now, let me tell you. <laughs> but anyway, so... I mentioned this last time that when you start doing this, you start attacking, not attacking, but like basically denying other scientific fields. I mean, right there to say the age of the earth thing, the reason I always like to come back to it. So now you have an issue with geology and just earth science in general. Uh, you have an issue with astronomy or anything that has to do with space now. And that, that that's what I just don't get. Are you saying that just science in a whole is just wrong and should not be taught? Because you like to say that it's just evolution, but it's not. I mean, you're denying a lot here. Well, again, one topic at a time. I love science. I taught earth science and physical science and biology for 15 years, and I know the subject pretty well, junior high and high school level, mostly high school. So I'm not against science. I'm against the pollution that's mixed in with our science, like evolution. Yeah, I, I want to get, I love the science, but the age of the earth is not provable scientifically. I go through on video number one, I was trying to find it real quick here, but I got 8 million slides. But the moon is going around the earth, but the moon's getting further away, a couple inches a year, inch in, in 1.6 or something, they argue with the exact number. But the, nobody disagrees, the moon's getting farther from the earth. It's called the lunar recession problem, Google it. Okay, well, that means it used to be closer. What factors could possibly change that. I mean, we could put a string on the moon and hold it in or something. It's something we cannot possibly affect by anything we do on Earth. The moon, the moon is getting further. Okay. Well, they've done all the math on this and said, wow, if you bring the moon in closer, gravity becomes stronger, tides become higher, and it's like two magnets with the inverse square law. If you half the distance, you flip the half fraction over and square it. It's four times the gravitational pull. At half the distance, it's four times the pull. At one third the distance, it's nine times the pull. Everybody that's done the math on this says, look, about one billion years ago, the Earth-Moon system would collapse, they snap together. You cannot have an Earth older than one billion years old, maybe 1.2. But you want to claim it's 4.6. It's not possible. Forget the Bible, forget everything else. The Moon says it can't be more than one billion years old, but you can't turn your frog to a prince in one billion years. you got to have more time. The Earth is spinning, but the Earth is slowing down. It's measurable. That's why we have what's called a leap second every year and a half. The moon, the earth is slowing down in its spin. We know what's causing it. The tidal breaking up and down, the internal friction against the underside of the crust, the lunar drag. There's known factors that are scientifically testable. The earth is slowing down. Google it. Okay. Well, that means it used to be going faster. We'll go back in time. How much faster could it go before this would create a serious problem? If the earth were spinning faster, all kinds of things would go crazy on the Earth. You cannot go back billions of years just with the spin of the Earth or the lunar recession. The sun is burning up a lot of fuel. Step outside and look at it. The sun is burning up 5 million tons a second. 
It's shrinking five feet per hour. Well, duh, go back in time in your imagination. It used to be bigger and heavier. Well, that's going to upset the gravitational balance. You can't have the Sun-Earth system being billions of years old just because of the way the Sun is burning up its fuel. I cover 30 of those, Ryan, on my video number one. I'll send it to you if you like for free. You can watch it online. Uh, so the point is, there are lots of scientific indicators you cannot have billions of years. Now, if all you said about uh, astronomy and the stars, I cover that on video number seven for 20 minutes. We don't know the distance to the stars. You don't know the star light's always been the same. They know they've been able to speed up light and slow it down in the laboratory. That's been done many times. They speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light at Princeton. And your Big Bang Theory says the universe, the actual matter traveled faster than the speed of light, away from the rapid expansion. Start off with a proton, expand to everything we see today. You can't fit a gallon of milk into a dot the size of a proton, let alone the whole Pacific Ocean, let alone all the stars and planets. It is so insane that so many people have swallowed this dumb lie that everything came from a dot exploding. There's 30 or 40 scientific indicators you can't have billions of years. And I know if we take away time, that is where to go here. That's the pacifier to the evolutionist. If you take away, that's what keeps them happy. They somehow can imagine everything happening if you give them billions of years. I'm sorry, you, don't, you can't have billions of years. And even then it wouldn't work. Nobody's ever seen a cow produce a non-cow. But you want to have a cow and a ladybug related. And you're related to a potato in your mind. I, I don't know how to help you. See, you keep saying that we have to have this time. It's not that you have to have it. You just have it because that's how much time has occurred. I mean, it's, it's, it, that's a fact. But regardless, once again, why, so all these people, like millions upon millions of people alive today that are studying these sciences, I mean, they're just wrong. Like they're, you're smarter than all of them. Is that what you're claiming? Actually, Ryan, right. if I could jump in, uh, if I could jump in here real quick, uh, Kent did provide a, a few examples or lines of argumentation supporting his position of, of a young earth. Is there any one of them that you wanted to try and counter and, and we can give you equal time to maybe address scientifically or, but it, it's up to you, Ryan. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I will. It's just the uh, thing is, it doesn't matter. He, he doesn't believe in science. And that's what I'm trying to figure out if there's any sciences that we can agree on or if he does believe well, he did use si well he, he did use scientific based arguments to support the lines of evidence he just provided now well, you may disagree with that but do you have did. any sign okay, to an extent ahead. but he didn't also like the thing is he he's just making claims that aren't true he doesn't understand the science the the, the thing with the moon or you want to go with the sun or all of the other ones he decided to touch on it he's just misrepresenting or completely just not understanding the science and that's why i asked the question if he does agree with any scientists out there, other, I, I just don't understand it. It's just, it's very confusing. I, I agree. You don't understand it. I love science. Absolutely love it. S well, evolution is not science, Ryan. It is science that potatoes produce potatoes. It is science that potatoes can produce a variety of potatoes. And you can scientifically select for bigger potatoes or smaller potatoes. That's called artificial selection. Farmers do that all the time. It is science that cows produce cows. And you could decide, I want to raise a herd of cows that are all white. And you could select all the white ones to breed, and pretty soon after eight or ten generations, they're all white. You haven't created anything. You already had hair, already had white cows. Now you got all white cows. Okay, big deal. But you can't turn the cow to a potato or vice versa. And you, Science is what we can observe. And the fact that, that all the scientists believe it, first, that's not true. Secondly, that wouldn't matter. And thirdly, the way science advances is people like me standing up saying, oh, excuse me, I think we're wrong about this. I think you can use, I think somebody could make electricity. Whoa, let's try. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try this. And you try enough experiments and pretty soon, wow, we got somebody says, hey, we can get electricity. All the inventions in science are because somebody challenged the status quo. Yes, I'm not smarter than all of them. I'm smarter than a lot of them. But uh, I think that if they believe they came from a rock, they're not, they're not following science. Science is what we can observe and know. What do we know? It comes from the Latin word seer. We know Cows produce cows. That we know. We do not know cows and potatoes have a common ancestor. You don't know that. You believe those things. That's where the word evolution has six different meanings. Microevolution is a lousy term. I don't think we should use it, but they do. All it is is variations within the kind. Bigger cows, smaller cows. They've been trying for a long time to get smaller dogs. I saw one today. 
I couldn't believe it. Completely useless. This big, little bitty toy cup chihuahua, whatever the thing is. That thing wouldn't last 10 seconds out in the woods by itself. The ants would eat it, okay? It, does, it has no chance of survival on, in nature. Now, it's been artificially selected by man, but it's still a dog. Barely recognizable as a dog, but it's a dog, okay? That's all they've ever done is get variations within the same kind. They're never going to get a dog as small as a flea or as big as Texas. There are limits. Why you guys can't admit, yes, variations happen, but they're limited. You'll never admit that. You think they go forever. No, and once again, see right there, evolution does not say that we came from a rock. It does not say that a dog will produce a non-dog or a cow will produce a non-cow. That's not what it says at all. You just don't understand it. Or more, what I should say is you're misrepresenting it on purpose because that's your thing. I get that. And I have no issue with that. I mean, that's, that's your whole shtick. But regardless, it's just not evolution. That's not what it says. It says things evolve slowly over millions and millions of years. I know you don't believe in the millions and billions of years. That's why I kept going back and trying to understand it more from your perspective, because it's just crazy to me. But hey, to each their own, I guess. And the thing with science, is science is not just a definition or meaning of a Latin word. It's a process. Like it's it, there's an entire process to them coming up with these scientific theories. And first they start with their you know idea and then their hypothesis and blah blah blah. You, I'm sure you've heard it a million times. But it, it's you just keep you either try to oversimplify things or just make them so outlandish, it just doesn't make sense anymore. I mean, wh why do you keep saying evolution is we claim that we came from rock or we claim that dogs produce non dogs? It's not what uh, people that the majority of people that believe in evolution, it's not what they believe at all, it's not what they say. Well. Did the universe begin as a little tiny dot, smaller than a proton, according to, the, according to uh, what the textbooks teach? Where did time, space, and matter come from? Do you believe in the Big Bang? How's that for a start? Well, kind of gloss over everything, but that's fine. Uh, yeah, I do believe in the Big Bang theory. I, I, and once again, when I say I believe in it, I just, for me personally, that's the best theory we have. And we have a lot of evidence for it. And don't, please don't say a point that exploded into everything we have today. That's not what happened. It was an, a rapid expansion of the most, you know, smallest bits and particles and pieces of dust that got spread out rapidly throughout the universe and slowly started collecting together. And then eventually, over a very long time, which you have an issue with, formed what we have today. So did the planet Earth form in that of those dust particles getting together? How did we get this planet we're standing on? Yeah, How exactly. Okay. So a bunch of these things from the from the rapid expansion, all these particles, which are flying out like spokes on a wheel, getting further apart the longer you wait, somehow they got back together and made a planet called Earth because of the gravitational attraction of the particles. Would that be part of the well, scientific theory? Sort of a no. I mean, you're, you're not, you, you have the right idea, but the problem is you're still thinking of it as an explosion. You're thinking of these pieces like just boom, and they're gone, like all the way to the depths of the universe i mean it, this is this is why it's called an expansion and also you're just not getting the scale of everything but anyway sorry keep going okay so the planet earth formed somehow from all the particles rapidly expanding suddenly some of them got together to form a planet earth pretty good size you know uh, planet and plus the other ones are lots bigger but somehow well, they got seven. together okay right. it made a planet now was this planet a hot ball of rock for some length of time during the theory Yes, it was a hot ball of rock, and yes, eventually water rained onto it and formed into a pool that is just one theory for abiogenesis. But still, it's not evolution. Don't think that we just came from rocks. I get where you're going with that. It's fun and hilarious. That, it's true. The it's earth not. was a hot ball of rock. The earth was a hot ball of rock. It cooled down. It rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive. You No, believe. the soup did yeah. not come alive. Or I organic material biology. formed into eventually what we can consider life very very primitive right. single cell right. organisms i know not the soup didn't just come alive and start rising out like it's just oh, no. it's a, i get why you say this it's very entertaining but it's just such a ridiculous thing to say it is a ridiculous thing to believe the soup came we alive don't believe before. that you do we don't believe what you're saying came from a rock I wish you guys no. could admit it. 
I know you're embarrassed I make it look so, because it's so stupid. It's so obvious it's stupid. A four-year-old's going to say that ain't true. But no, you how you are saying it is stupid. It was okay. they, the materials that eventually formed this organic matter that formed into what we consider life came from the water hitting hitting the rock in the surface of the earth. But that's not saying we came from a rock. It's not the same thing. I don't know how you can't see it. We got we got 14 topics on the table now. Okay, Ryan, let's go back to the moon. Okay. No, we're not. We're just talking about this. No, we're talking about oh, well, the rock thing. That's I'll what just, you brought I'll up. You. So let's keep there going. I'll just hit this and run then, unless you want to comment. NASA.gov, space place. The moon is leaving us. The moon's recession rate. It's everybody agrees. Space answers. Uh, let's see. Na uh, space answers.com. The moon is leaving us. Physics.org has an article about that. The moon is leaving us about 3.8 centimeters a year. The moon is leaving us. Okay. Well, if you bring it back into one third the distance, you flip it and square it, it's nine times the gravitational pull. So you go back a thousand years ago, the moon's 125 feet closer. No big deal. Go back a million years ago, 28 miles closer. A bit, 10 million, 284 miles. 100 million, 2, 000, almost 3,000 miles closer. A billion, 28,000 miles closer. And I think everybody agrees that studies this, the moon, you can't have this problem with suddenly it collapses 1.4 billion years ago. Here's the article, Astronomical Journal, a peer-reviewed journal, said the lunar orbit collapses a little over a billion years ago. They've known this for a long time. You cannot have 4.6 billion years to turn your rock soup into a human. It just, it's not available. Now, if you want to believe it, fine. Now, as far as the majority of scientists, I'm trying to rescue science from a really dumb idea. They somehow got suckered into believing this evolution religion. And if you don't believe it, you won't get peer reviewed and you won't pass the university test. And it's a, it's a cult. It's nothing but a cult. The, it's not, the science is fine. I love science. But evolution is mixed in with science. It's polluted science. So don't say I'm against science. I love science. Give me a scientific question. I'll, I'll tell you what I know about it. I, I taught it 15 years. I'm pretty versed at it. But evolu we don't ever see any animal produce other th what anybody would consider the same kind. Dogs produce dogs with, without exception. But in your imagination, dogs came from a single cell creature like a protozoa over slow billions of changes. They get a bunch of protozoa and make it into a dog again. I want to see it this time. Oh man, that was a lot. Anyway, the the moon thing. I mean, I I don't know why you keep going back to that, but it's it's you're not taking into consideration the acceleration rate, and that doesn't matter. Anyway, I want to go back to the whole soup nonsense that you want to keep bringing up on the rock, because I, I just don't understand why you keep saying it. Or a dog produced dog. No one says it's not going to produce a dog. But anyway, no one claims we came from rocks. So I understand that's what you think people claim. So if it didn't then why why is that crazy but it's not for a giant whatever almighty being to go on to with some dust and make a human how is that more scientifically not only accurate but there, how how does the mechanics of that work i mean that's none of that makes sense <clears throat> but, okay. but but to claim that we never mind sorry go ahead oh, no fair enough good good quick for me to believe that a human being can take clay from the ground, shape it into a coffee cup, bake it in an oven, and turn it into something useful like a coffee cup. I believe that. I believe an intelligent person who's not in the coffee cup, not even part of the coffee cup, can take and make the coffee cup. I believe that. I think I could show you that happen. Okay? Now, for me to believe the coffee cup made itself, that would be insane. Okay? I think intelligent people can take iron ore out of the ground, smelt it down, make steel, make different alloys, and make a car. But to claim the car made itself, I can't believe that. I, I think that'd be silly. For God outside of our human body and outside of our restrict, we are restricted by time, space, matter. The God that I worship is not restricted by any of those. This ain't 2022 in heaven. He, there's no time. He's outside it. He created time, space, matter for us. And I'm enjoying it. But uh, God, I believe in a God that's outside of those things. Those, we're restrained. You can't go back five seconds. Many times I wished I could. Wish we had a control Z on life. You know, we don't have one of them. So, but God is not, you're trying to get a limited God who's like, like us. The God that made you is outside of time, space, matter. The guy that made the coffee cup is outside of the coffee cup. But somebody had to make it. You'd be a fool to believe this made itself from an explosion in a clay pit. 
It doesn't happen. So life is way too complex to have happened by chance. It had to have a designer. Now, which designer? Is it Allah or Buddha or Jehovah? That becomes a different argument. Which God? I've got the right one, by the way. But, uh, the, but there has to be a God. There's no other option. It has to be somebody outside of time, space, matter to create time, space, matter. You got the problem. 13.772 billion years ago, this rapid expansion took place. Well, what was going on 14.7 billion years ago? What happened before that? Where did time come from? The same thing could be asked to you. What happened before God created everything? What was he doing? Just chilling in a black void? But who no, no, cares? Anyway. Not, you're, not, not anyway. Your question is assuming God's limited by time. The no, question, I'm saying before he created everything. That's what I'm saying. The word, the, word before, the word before nullifies your question. If I said, why are elephants orange? The question is no good. They're not orange. There is no before with God. God is outside of time, space, matter. He made it. So you can't use the word before in the same sentence with God and make it into a question. There is no well, before can, with God. I mean, are you saying well, you he didn't, he didn't exist then? It's a non no. You're st still trying to limit him to our time. No, I'm not. I'm saying, listen, listen, you claim, I don't know why we're on this topic, but who cares? I'm, I'm into it, actually. You claim that the world is 6,000 years old. So 6,000 years ago, before the world was here, sorry to say before, but I don't know what other word you want me to use. Did God just not exist? Was he not around? Was he was he in a different universe or just chilling up in heaven? I mean, I was, I'm just curious. Again, I didn't actually expect you to answer any of this, but sure, go ahead. No, no, no. I'll be glad. You're still, you still are very limited in your thinking about God. If God is not limited by our time, space, matter, you're trying to limit him by our space. We are no, stuck I'm in a not. universe. I'm yes, asking, where was he then? That's He's what I'm asking. He's of time, space, matter. I don't okay, think our brain so that's what I'm it. asking. Before he created it, what was he doing? That's all I said. The word, the word before nullifies your question. <laughs> he, there is no. What are you talking no about? Before. You are stuck in time, just like I am. I'm, I'm we not think stuck in time. One, you don't even after. understand time. It's space time for one. It's not time, space, matter. It's space time. Space time is a thing. Okay. Time was just a, a concept invented by humans, but that doesn't matter. Let's go back to the God thing. All I'm asking is, when there wasn't an earth, when this wasn't here, when there was nothing, I just was wondering where God was. And again, that was more rhetorical than anything. I didn't expect you to answer, but if you want to, please. Oh, no. I'll be glad to give an answer. Your question used two words, when and where, oh, my Lord. and was, that nullifies yeah. it. You are still stuck with the itty-bitty God that you can control. No, right? I'm, I'm not. I'm not trying to diminish your God. I'm saying I'm agree. I'm saying like under the assumption that He is this Almighty Being. It is around, all outside of everything. Cool. I'm okay with that. Whatever. But look, you agree that the Earth is six thousand years old, right? That's that's your idea. I, I believe the Bible clearly teaches that, and a lot of scientific indicators indicate that. Okay, yep. so that's what I'm saying. That's what you believe. So six thousand right. years ago. What was going on? Or let's go, let's go 10,000 years ago. Well, I know that doesn't work because there wouldn't have been an earth in your mindset, but still, you get what I'm asking here. You're the I, one that I kept diving into this. I was using it rhetorically. Like, if we want right. to keep going, let's go. Right. I completely get what you're asking, and you do not get what you're asking. Okay. <laughs> what? You oh are trying God. to limit God to time, space, matter like Dude, we are. I am not God limiting is. him. I'm saying he's in this in this theor in this weird theoretical thing. I'm asking, I'm agreeing and saying like, yes, okay, he's outside of space time. He is this almighty thing that surpasses all. He doesn't time doesn't affect him. Cool, but I was just wondering what he was doing. That's it. There you go. What he was doing doing is a time sensitive word indicating he's locked in time. I am doing something right now. I'm spending my time writing things out. You're stuck with a god that is limited. You need to get a much bigger God. God created time, space, matter. Space, time, matter didn't create God. No, Look, he didn't the, create the, time. Time is just well, a concept made by humans. Right. That's it. Now, hold on. He didn't create no time. Right. Do you no know what space time is? Yeah. The purpose of the debate, though, is not for me to prove God to you or even to try no, to. No, I know. You're the one that went on. The, you're you're the one that answered the question. I was just well, going. You're, with you're way off. Donnie, we're way off track. The purpose is for him to provide evidence for evolution. We've yeah, never seen pointless. You don't believe in it. You don't believe in the evidence. You don't believe in science. Okay, let me jump in, guys. I'll get us back on track. We've got 10 more minutes until we reach the hour mark. Then we'll oh, get into the Oh, come on. Let's just keep going with the God thing. That's way more interesting. 
Well, guys, we'll rather hear about that. Well, however you guys want to proceed, the topic is evolution is on trial. I know we've discussed. I know it is, and I, and I get that, but we've already established that he doesn't believe in the evidence. That's fine. There's no point to that. No, and, and, and listen, you're the one that claim on every debate that you want to change or get them thinking right or go with your. So why not do that then? That's that's what you say you want to do every well, time. Go Before ahead, you slap it, Ron, uh, Ryan, I do believe in the evidence. I would like to see some evidence of any animal or plant creating anything that anybody with one functioning brain cell would consider a different kind. You believe you're related to a potato, okay? Where is the evidence that you and a potato have a common ancestor? Where's the evidence for this? You all can believe that. All life is the evidence for that. I mean, that's, what that's is the it? whole point of it. All life is the evidence for that. I mean, we we know we know that, but you don't believe in that evidence. You don't believe in that process. I, 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 I love can't evidence. help that. All evidence, you said not. Wait a minute, let me get it straight. All the evidence says that you and a potato are related. Is that what you're saying? I said all life is the evidence. You and me are evidence of evolution. All life is evidence of evolution. But you just don't agree with that. You don't believe in it. I, 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 well, this is where you're confused what evolution is. I believe I had parents that were both human. I believe I had grandparents that were human. I never saw them, but I would be willing to bet $10 my grandparents, great-grandparents were human. Yes, and I if you go back far enough, eventually they wouldn't be what we consider a that, modern that's homo sapiens. That's what I want to see the evidence for. Where You've is the seen evidence? It. For this I've watched you see it. You've done 300 of these. I have watched okay. you see all the evidence and not agree with it, not believe in it. That, there, that's, I mean, that's just your mindset. Well, the textbooks are showing our kids who are very impressionable that a protozoa turned to a biology teacher and turned to a bird and a fish and a reptile and a frog. They, this is the family trees that they show, and they claim this is science. This isn't science, this is imagination. See, you're looking at that and you're saying like they turned into it. Well, that's the wrong way to look at that. That's just that's just a very oversimplification in either an elementary, maybe middle school or hopefully not high school textbook. But regardless, that's not you're just it's too simple. And, and that's the point, because back then, you know, kids start simply and then you gradually increase. Right. You evolve your way of teaching, if you will. <laughs> um, but you just that's not what it says. Like, it's not going to turn into something else like that. Like it's going to have very minute, very almost barely can tell changes until enough of them have happened over enough amount of time or long amount of time that it turned into something that we wouldn't consider that species anymore. It can't interbreed with its parent, with the past yeah. species, but regardless, this and, and you complain that we're teaching kids this, but if you're teaching kids that we came from some dude going into some dust and that the world's only 6,000 years old. What, why is your way okay? Well, it's very hard to be right on everything, but I've been doing it for so long. I'm getting pretty good at it, okay? <clears throat> okay. This, this, this textbook shows the kids the turtle and the lizard and the snake and the bobcat and the bird have a common ancestor. And it goes, shows a high school biology class showing it going back to an early reptile. Do you believe the birds and the turtles are related? Yeah, I mean, it makes way more sense than they all got destroyed in the flood and then all of a sudden popped up 4,000 years later. So that makes way more sense. Okay, well, th where's the evidence for this being true? Oh, we don't see I mean, it. once again, you know all the evidence. Fossils are evidence. Um, the DNA is evidence. Uh, you can, I mean... Here's the issue. You just, you don't believe in it. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, that's not my fault. You just, you were taught the wrong way or you learned the wrong way and now you're here. But why, once well, again, why, why is your way okay? Why is your way right? Well, like I said, I've been right for so long. It's getting, I'm getting good at it, but uh, nobody, nobody, this what do you book write shows, about? listen, okay. Protozoa. Are there still protozoa in the world today? <clears throat> oh God, here we go. Yes, there is. Are there are there protozoa alive today by the trillions? Yes, yes, and there's okay. a bunch of different kinds or variations or whatever. Okay. And no, they won't just turn into a dog magically because that's not what evolution says for the millionth time. Well, for the millionth time, yes, it is what they say. They show no, it. No, it isn't. Protozoa. No, raise a bunch of protozoa in the laboratory and make them change to anything but a protozoa. It doesn't happen. You imagine that the protozoa could slowly, over millions and trillions or quadrillions and sextillions of, of generations, turn into a frog. No, I believe that it'll get enough 
uh, enough changes will happen to it that it'll eventually be a different life form from what it started out as millions and billions of years ago. But that's okay. not the same thing as saying it magically turns into a frog. And then those will split oh, off to a bunch of I, other I different kinds. Did, I, did, I didn't say it magically turned. I'll give you trillions of years. Don't Show need trillions. Me. It's only billions. Okay. It's only about oh, what, okay. 13.9 billion point. billions for the universe. Right. right. I'll give you 4.6 billion. Okay. Show me the evidence of any animal changing to something that anybody would consider a different kind. I mean, My Bible says. Are you and I are the evidence. I've already said this. Like, if you go back to your whole grandparent, great grandparent, blah 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 blah, eventually right. you will get far enough back that what you find is not considered what we consider Homo sapiens, a modern human. It'll have enough changes. It'll that it's a, a different life form, different species, a variation, a kind, whatever stupid word you want to use. That's the, but you okay. just don't believe in that. So and 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 I get why not. <clears throat> As you believe we came from Adam and Eve, but that's not a that's that's not scientific. It doesn't teach anything. That doesn't you can't test. It can't be falsified. Like that's pointless to teach, and because it's, no. it's not true. But so what about all these forms of not quite apes or not quite humans or whatever? That what what are they then? If they're not if they're not in the evolutionary chain, because like we would consider that makes sense. So are you saying well, they're just random life forms that died out? And I think so, most of them, go ahead. Most of the things that they're calling human ancestors, like ape-like ancestors, have been proven to be frauds or misidentified no, or fully human, haven't. fully ape. Well, are there There's any alive that today? Haven't been proven to be falsified? Well, you just okay. you just find one little thing that says it might be or leads to that, and then you run with it and say, "Oh, that's what they think now." But that's why there's a majority. That's why it is. That's why it works like that. Well, you I cover this on, the video, of some one dude. on my video number one and two, I cover this in great detail. Things like the Piltdown Man, they said it was a missing link and it turned out to be a tooth from a pig. They're real desperate to hey, want to find again, missing links. We're taking these very t weird and off things that happened. What about all of them that they found? There's been a lot of them. It's not just one. They found okay. entire skeletal structures that were definitely not human, but definitely not ape-like either. They're okay. a little bit in between. If, if, let's, if they find an entire skeleton that is not human, not ape, but they appears have. to be, it appears to be what some anatomist would say halfway between the two. Does that prove it is a transition or could it be an extinct, a, extinct species? Something died off. It's both. It was a transitional species that went extinct. And regardless, say if our DNA testing is so good that we can test as far back as we want and all this stuff. If you find out that you are related to them 100% through DNA testing, would you then believe in it? Or are you still just saying something else happened? Those scientists don't know what they're talking about, like all the other millions of scientists don't. Well, if I did, a, if I did an analysis of this coffee cup and found out it's made of clay and did an analysis of something else made of clay, I think I could find they both came from clay. Does that prove they're related or they're common design? Well, they should, they should be related to you, right? Because, I mean, you believe we came from dust or clay or whatever, so... I be. believe God. I think God can take dust and make it come alive. I don't think the dust can come alive by itself. I don't think the coffee cup can make itself. No, I don't say it made itself. It happened through a process. Once again, of the most, the, the a, if you're going to go to abiogenesis, the process we consider the most likely is the whole rain falling well, off onto the sur surface of the earth, pulling together and forming what we consider life. So you do believe you came from a rock. No, I just explained what I believe, but you're too simple-minded to either hear me or comprehend it, apparently. Uh, I heard you fine. I believe an intelligent person made this coffee cup and even named it right, Dr. Kent, the science gent. That's wonderful. No, I believe that. Definitely not doctor. You need a doctorate for that. <laughs> I got the four of them, but that's okay. Uh, well, you don't have a diploma mill. Now, if, if somebody goes to college and believes they end up, came, comes out believing they came from a rock, I don't like their doctorate either, but that's okay. It's unrelated. That's an ad hominem attack. Let's just skip that. I think you have said that you believe these single-celled life creatures, some of them, whichever one, there's 20,000 different kinds of single-cell creatures, slowly added somehow, somehow added information and became everything we see today. The textbooks show a single-celled creature, pick which one you want out of the 20,000, slowly. At, how did it grow arms and legs and a brain and a heart and lungs and a pancreas and a prostate gland? How did this happen? Show it to me. There are still plenty of sunk single-celled organisms today. The world's full of them. 
we can make a gener new generation every eight hours with some of them. You could sit in your laboratory and in one lifetime watch probably a million generations of amoeba. Why do yes, they never in one lifetime things? of a human? That's just not enough okay. time. Don't know what to tell you. It just isn't. Okay. Well, show, me, show, me, show me an amoeba becoming anything yeah. but an, an amoeba. Where's the evidence for this? You're not going to see that. You will potentially see. Well, amoeba is a bad word. I'll just go with protus to be more general. Uh, you okay, will potentially okay. see one with a variation and a change. I mean, I've already I went over that last time with you, but you know, you didn't believe huh. that either. Um, so you will see changes and variations in them, and, and maybe even if you're lucky, a kind that changed or you know evolved uh, into one that won't be able to produce offspring with the parent organism but that's again that's you're it's still that probably won't because it's just not enough time and i know you don't like that word but it's just how it is no i love it because it shows you have a religion no Long there's ago, no social yeah, structure yeah. there's no there's no worshiping anything it's not a religion oh, yeah, it isn't it's a scientific sure. theory that you don't you comprehend time. time is your god I believe no, God, a man, a man can be process made up of humans. Well, Ryan, let, I just want to make sure because a little bit of crosstalk, the echo starts. Okay, go ahead. Okay. And then Ron will throw it back to you after. Well, I believe an intelligent human can take clay and make a coffee cup. I believe a God can take clay and make a human. I don't believe that the clay can make a human by itself with any amount of time. No amount of time. Okay, not going to happen. Go that's, ahead. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, it definitely wouldn't happen. Because that's not what evolution say would happen, but yeah, you once again you just don't comprehend it. I got nothing for you, man. You just don't understand science. I mean, you might understand that it came from the Latin word to know or whatever nonsense you want to throw out there, but you don't understand the process, obviously. But truthfully, I think you do. You just misrepresent it and all that for the money and stuff. I get that, you know, the entertainment and all that. So I, I do oh, believe that you understand it. No, it's not, I do understand it, and it's not entertainment. This is serious. You understand oh, Pascal yeah. Wager, Ryan? Black and Pascal so Wager. Serious. If I'm right and there's a God, you're in trouble. If you're right no, and there's no I'm God, not. we're not the best. I don't. I didn't lose a thing. I had a wonderful life. But you guys do believe you came from a rock and primordial soup. This is the theory. This is what I'm saying isn't science. So it's why am religion. I in trouble? Why am I in trouble? Because I'll go to hell. Big deal. You don't even well, know what hell okay. is. You know why? Why? Why is hell so bad? Why is the devil so bad? What did right, you do? Enjoy it. Hey, you enjoy it when you get down. I mean, you okay. know, if if you ain't there, I'll be pretty happy. Okay, I'm sure. I promise. I, I deserve to be there, but I won't be there. So you just see how happy you. We'll see how Nobody happy you are. Be there because it doesn't exist. But even if it does, that still doesn't change the fact that the world is billions of years old. Things evolve, not just life. Everything. You just. I don't know. You just don't believe that for whatever reason i got i get it completely i think things variations happen within the kind there are four thousand species of potatoes somebody decided to call it a new species okay it's still it's still a potato and there's i think only one species of humans there's lots of different colors lots of different sizes there's eye colors hair color etc but they're still humans still infertile but you but believe see, you're related with, to a potato. the problem with that is though is that there isn't there's even if you want to go with kinds and group every close to enough species that you can group together that you want it, that'd be tough to do but you can do it even all the different you know not just dogs but like wolves coyotes foxes everything else and put them all together as a dog whatever you want to do i don't care there wasn't enough of them on the ark to to turn into what we have today so you still have to believe in some form of evolution even if it is rapid you still believe in it. Well, this is, again, back to the definition of the word. Microevolution is a lousy term. I believe all the thousand kinds of bananas could have come from a banana. I believe all the 60 kinds of eagles could have come from an eagle. I think all 600 types of oaks could have come from an oak. But that doesn't mean an oak and an eagle have a common ancestor. Do you believe an oak tree and an eagle have a common ancestor? Yes, of course I do. And once again, so let's just, let's stick with the trees. Then how do we have what we have today? All the trees would have been dead and gone. Where'd they come from? Did God just well, go like that? Pop them up? I think like this no, isn't think scientific. You. That's the big issue. This is why I have such a problem with it. Your theory or your entire worldview has no science behind it whatsoever. You can't even explain it scientifically. So well, I can explain. It. 
No, a designer, a designer created the oak trees with a really complex gene code. I mean, all the scientists in the world today could not make an acorn. So he created the oak the trees after the flood? Well, no. All the scientists today couldn't make an acorn. That acorn has the DNA knowledge and code to make a whole tree full of acorns. But you get all the scientists in the world say, I want you to start from nothing but chemicals and make an acorn. They can't do it. I think the acorn had, has a code that some of them produce, you know, harder oak, softer oak, white oak, black oak, or, or, uh, pin oak, or 600 kinds of oak. I believe they had a common ancestor called an oak tree. That code is amazing. I think a designer had to make that. Eight different kinds of bears might have had a common ancestor, a bear. But you believe an oak tree and a bear are related. I bet you, I bet you, I, you and I know you are believe you're related to an acorn. Yeah, and you believe some dude just went bam and made some trees after I, a flood, apparently. There's no correct. science behind that. That's the whole issue. Like, what are you teaching the kids then? Ryan, the science is what we observe. We observe oak trees always produce oak trees without exception. But you no, didn't observe no. a flood or even have any evidence for it, but yet you well, believe in the flood. Well, I know you don't want to believe in the flood because that represents the judgment of God on man's sin. But you don't want no, to I don't care about you. that. There's no evidence for, for it. You, Ryan, it's coming for you, too. You're going to be judged one day. I'm trying to help you. You don't want help. Great. There's a, the bridge is out. OK, you're headed for a bridge out. You want to keep driving? Keep driving. But I'm warning you, you're headed for problems. That's not the purpose of this debate. Where is the evidence that you are related to a potato? You claim you are. Where's the evidence for this? Nobody ever sees a human make a non-human. And let Nobody. me jump in real quick. Oh. Go, go uh, ahead with questions and answers if you want. We're going to get nowhere here. But. <laughs> uh, it, it's been a fun discussion for sure. We're a couple minutes over on the discussion portion. So why don't we, any final points or thoughts that we do want to make? Um, we've got, let's say, three-minute closing statements. So we'll do so there. This will be a good time for us to wrap everything up that was discussed in this discussion portion, which we've done for about an hour. So, uh, Ryan, go ahead. We'll start with you. Let's say three minutes. We'll, we'll give Kent three minutes, and then we'll do, um, we'll do some audience questions. So go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I just want to say, of course, thank you again for having me, and even Mr. Hoven for debating with me. I know it's you know, probably better ones to do without there, but I enjoy it nonetheless. It's, it is fun to learn your worldview. But anyway, as you've seen, once again, he just doesn't care or believe in the science and just provides more nonsense with that not only doesn't have any evidence or science to back it up, it couldn't because it's, you know, not falsifiable. But anyway, I'll keep it short. I know we went over and started late. So let's just uh, get into the questions or sorry to Mr. Hoven's closing and then to the questions. Thanks again for having me. I do really appreciate it. Okay, Ryan, thank you for those final words. And we do have a lot of excellent audience questions. So for Kent's three minute closing statement, this is the audience's final opportunity to send in those questions. So Kent, we'll hand it over to you. Let's say three minutes and the floor is yours. Okay, the term they use microevolution is changes within a species or small group of organisms. I believe variations happen, but they're still obviously the same kind. The 4,000 varieties of potatoes are obviously a potato. They grow in the ground. They don't grow on trees. They don't grow on the back of cows. They're still a potato growing in the ground, okay? And if you want to believe you're related to one, great. But microevolution, I think, is a lousy term. We shouldn't use it because of the confusion goes on in people like Ryan's mind. He believes microevolution is evidence for evolution. It's evidence there's variations within the kind. The idea that there are transitional fossils, evidence for something changing to something else, first place, no fossil could count. No fossils count. All you know is it died. You don't know it had any children. You certainly don't know those bones you found in the dirt had children that were different than themselves. No animal today can do this. Why can no animal today produce anything other than its kind? Cows produce cows without exception. But in your imagination, long ago, far away, it's fairy tale, absolute fairy tale stuff. Yes, boys and girls, the princess kissed the frog and it turned to a prince. Now that we know is a fairy tale. But in your fairy tale, if you take the frog and wait billions of years, it'll turn to a prince. Same fairy tale with a new magic ingredient called time. No fossils count as evidence for evolution. All you know is it died. Why can't they make this happen today? Why don't we see get a laboratory, make life again out in the laboratory? If it can happen in a warm pond on the earth, do it again. 
Why can't they make life? Just any life. Let's see it. Why can't they make any single cell creature turn into a human again? Oh, it takes too long. Well, then it isn't science. Science is limited to what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Anything outside of that is imagination, even if it's true. Even if it later turns out to be true, it so far isn't in the category of science. And evolution is not part of science. It's a fairy tale for, for grown-ups. And I'm sorry you fell for it. Okay, go ahead. Donnie, go ahead. What happened here? Oh. Oh, I'm here. I'm here. I just stepped away for two seconds to uh, get all some right. water. So, okay. We're all good. Thank you, Ryan and Kent, for those uh, short and sweet closing statements. Okay, let's, uh, let's get into some questions. We've got lots. Uh, so, okay. So, let's start here. Um, Ryan, as you probably remember, whoever the question is for, we'll make sure they get the last word, but both debaters will have the opportunity to respond. So first question comes in for Kent from Creationist Crybaby. And CC's got a question. The question is, if two species of squirrel can no longer interbreed, how do they fit the definition of kind in the Bible? Well, if somebody sees the Kaibab squirrel and the Abert squirrel on opposite sides of Grand Canyon and notices they're still squirrel, the fact that they're still classed as squirrel would be, you know, I think enough for a four-year-old to say that's the same kind of animal. Can they interbreed? They might. I don't know that. They, I think those two can. There may be some examples. Well, like, for instance, Great Dane and Chihuahua. There are probably some mechanical problems there. He can't reach high enough if she's the, if she's the female, the, the Great Dane. But he probably wants to try. But, that's, but they, they probably genetically could. I bet you could mix, I bet you could artificially inseminate a Great Dane with a Chihuahua sperm and make a puppy. It'd be pretty dumb to do such a thing, but they could probably do it. Okay. So I think they're still within the dog kind. I think if you could get some that can no longer interbreed, you have a variation in what is still obviously the same kind. I don't have to defend the Bible definition of kind. It's guys like Ryan who believe the squirrel and the Great Dane and the, and the a bird have a common ancestor. That's what's not science. That's what's nonsense. These family trees, if you could get a branch on a tree where they can no longer interbreed, okay, great. Maybe that could happen. So what? It's still obviously the same kind. And I, I don't have to defend the Bible definition of kind, but this isn't science. That's all. This is imagination. They draw lines on paper and the kids believe it because they've been taught it since kindergarten. It's a real thorough brainwashing program. That's all it is. Okay, thank you for that response there, Kent. And Ryan, over to you if there's anything you'd like to add. Go ahead. Yeah, honestly, I was just curious to why he didn't answer the question. But um, no, he's right. There are not just squirrels, but species. Well, originally species of animals that have you know, evolved and can no longer interbreed. And that was the point that if they're still part of the same classification, what are they, you know, are they still a kind or are they not? I mean, that's why kind is such a rough word. I mean, there's, there's no strict definition to it. Okay, so thank you, Ryan. And you think, Kent? Well, go ahead, Kent. My, my parents produced three boys. We cannot interbreed and produce a baby. But we're still the same kind, called human. How about that for a cry of a cre creationist crybaby? Are my brother and I the same kind? We can't interbreed. I'm not talking right. about San Francisco now. I'm talking about here, Lenox, Alabama. Okay. Are we the same kind? Creation is crybaby. Yeah, we are. It's obvious to a four-year-old. So the squirrels are still squirrels. Okay, thank you for that final word there, Kent. And uh, next question comes in from George Bond. So we got a healthy amount of questions for the both of you, Ryan and Kent. So George is asking you, Ryan, how do you explain oceans with only 3.6% salt? If the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, nothing would survive in the oceans with the resultant salt content. Go ahead. Well, they would because they do. Um, and the world is that old. And that is, uh, what do you mean here? Like, are you saying that there should be more salt because the world is that old? If that's what you're saying, no, there shouldn't be. It, the, the world is that old and what we have is what we have. Like there's no, I mean, if you would have provided some kind of, anything that says that it should be somehow older maybe but it's 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 not or i mean not older uh more salt 
but it, it's just not. That's not how it works. Don't know what to tell you. Okay, thanks for the response there, Ryan. Appreciate it. Kent, over to you if you had a response. I have a good response. I, I, I've got evidence right here, and if I can find it in my 10 million slides in my PowerPoint. But video number one, I show clearly where they, they show the scientific evidence is the oceans are getting saltier. It's intuitive, first of all. Mineral salts wash off the ground into the rivers and end up in the ocean. All the rivers end up going into the ocean at some point. So it's intuitive that the salt from the minerals in the ground would get into the ocean. Everybody agrees with that. And then evaporation only takes out fresh water. It's called the distillation process. We've known for a long time <clears throat> the oceans are getting saltier. They've done tests on it. I've got the slides here somewhere if I can find it real quickly. But watch my video number one where I show it. Uh, yes, the oceans could have gone from completely fresh water to 3.6% in a few thousand years easily. Now, if someone wishes to believe it's billions of years old, they have a problem to answer. Why aren't they saltier? They should be real salty by now. The Dead Sea is dead because of the salt in it. It's what, way too much salt. So it, it killed itself, okay, it committed suicide. So yes, the oceans are getting saltier, and I think that's clear evidence that it cannot be billions of years old. I'll look it up some other time, but just Google ocean salinity. What is it? How much is it gaining every year? How long would it take? A couple thousand years, all you need. If you want billions of years of rivers bringing salt in, evaporation, taking water out, going up, raining again, bringing more salt in, you got a problem to explain. I don't have a problem with it. Okay, thank you, uh, Kent, for that response. Ryan, question was for you. So to be fair, you get the final word. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It uh, Once again, it's, it's about the rate at which the it has been gaining saltiness, if you will. And the evaporation thing, not all water rains over land, so it would rain over the ocean as well. But still, that's just – it's not – to say that is ridiculous. You you didn't provide any evidence. You just read something that said a thing, but that that's not what the majority of scientists believe for a reason, because the world is four and a half billion years old, and it is as salty as it is. There's nothing else to argue there. Okay. Th uh, thank you for that final word, Ryan. Next question comes in from Taylor K. Taylor, thanks so much for the question. Questions for you again, Ryan. She's asking, do you believe that all of the symbiotic relationships present in the world are required to sustain life or occurred by random chance? Well, what does she mean by that? The symbiotic relationships. Are you talking like how, you know, I guess the ecosystem of everything, like how life requires other life and stuff, prey and all that? I just, sorry, I've not heard that. As I said, not an expert. Yeah, yeah, like um, it, it's an argument Kent likes to put forth. Kent, if you wanted to quickly cover it, how life basically needs life, you know, bees, yeah, need no, I, I, there's I symbiotic think... relationships. That okay, that's what it. I was reading as, but I just wanted to clarify for sure. Um, so that is, I guess you can say it is random chance, but also not because they are based off of each other and they require each other. The ocean is a great example of that. For basically, the ocean all life should essentially equal in mass or weight to other life. Like the amount of say blue whales is going to be equal to the amount of the smallest life forms like plankton and other even smaller ones in mass or amount, you know, um, not actual number of population, obviously. So, and they do need that state or that, you know, balance. And if they don't, you see the world, the oceans getting saltier and getting, you know, oxygen and getting less, more pollution, all that stuff. And it's, and it's what's happening, and that's what is happening in the ocean right now. Overfishing is the major issue, but there's others as well. But um, no, I do, I guess I would say, yeah, I believe it happened by random chance, but random is also, it's not the best word. I mean, like all these random changes, they were random to an extent, but again, it was more, you know, what was happening at the time they were alive and in their environment and all that stuff. But anyway, yeah, I'll just say yes, by random chance. Okay, thank you for the response there, Ryan. Taylor, thanks for the question. And Kent, over to you if you had anything to, to add. There are literally millions, possibly billions of symbiotic relationships. The plants breathe in carbon dioxide, give off oxygen. All the animals breathe in oxygen, give off carbon dioxide. They reciprocate the gases. That's called a symbiotic relationship. The bees pollinate the flowers. The flowers produce the pollen for the bees to make the honey. 
How did the flowers get pollinated before the bees came along? Okay. How did the bees make their honey before the flowers came along? This is a, an example of, of literally millions and possibly billions of what anybody just Google symbiosis, symbiotic relationships. Okay. It doesn't work unless they're created quickly within a few days of each other. I think the nut was created to fit the bolt. One's no good without the other one, which came first. They made it by the same guy at the same time. So I think God created the world with millions of symbiotic relationships just so there'll be no excuse judgment day when he says, you believe this coffee cup came from a dot smaller than a proton? You really, why would you believe something so dumb? Who taught you that? Get your money back, son. This was dumb. I think it's, there's going to be no excuse judgment day for all of those who say, wow, I believe we came from a dot of near nothing, ex rapidly expanding. I'm sorry, almost said exploded. Okay. I believe that's going to be, you're going to realize, wow, I was duped. Yep, duped. So I think the symbiotic relationships are impossible to explain by evolution. All right. Thank you for the response there, Kent. And Ryan, question was for you. You can have a quick final word. Yeah. I mean, the only reason you're answering it like that is once again, you're assuming that the world is only 6,000 years old and you're making that mistake. To assume that they all happened at once was is to also assume that they were all alive at once, and they weren't. There were different symbiotic relationships when there were different life forms alive that eventually went extinct for one reason or another, not because of a giant flood, but still. So, yes, we do have these symbiotic relationships, but that does not in any way disprove evolution because there will be different ones today than there was in the past, and there will be different ones in the future than there are today. I mean, bees and flowers are a great one. The bees are you know, they're in danger. They're going, some are going extinct. When they're all gone, what do you think is going to happen? All the flowers are going to die? No, they're going to evolve and turn into flowers that can survive without them, hopefully. Okay, thank you for that last word there, Ryan. Next question comes in for Kent, and this one comes in from Chris Peacock. So I've got it up on the screen here, and he is asking, how do you get the millions of species of animals from the thousands off of the ark without evolution? Great question. Fair question. I don't have to defend that because I'm not requiring that to be taught in public schools. I think they want to get their thousands of species of animals from a rock. I think that ought to be defended. But OK, back to the point. I think what we've seen with natural selection and human artificial selection is so obvious. I had a family meet me. At, uh, I was speaking someplace at a, years ago. I said there are now 350 breeds of dogs in the world. Most would not survive on their own in nature. Most have been created by man for some particular reason. And you got to babysit them now for the rest of their life. My, like my wife's incredibly stupid pug that she paid money for. Okay. Why would anybody do that? Okay. Dumbest dog in the world. Anyway, it's a pug. They, they got pugs all over the place. Pugly, ugly. But uh, so I think that changing from a original dog kind to a 300 varieties of dogs this family that I was, I was mentioned, I showed that there's 359, I think, b b breeds of dogs. And they, this lady said, Mr. Oven, our family's in the dog raising business. We've had a kennel for 100 years. Grandpa started it. Great, our great grandpa started it. Anyway, she said, I can tell you right now, within 100 years, you give us 30 or 40 generic dogs. Pick them out of the anywhere. Pick, give us a dog. We will, in 100 years, recreate all the breeds today. Chihuahua, Great Dane, Doberman. We can make them all in 100 years through selective breeding. But they're always going to be a dog. Natural selection is where the cold weather survives, the one with long fur to survive. You know, nature, the cold, thin fur can't survive up there. So I bet if you turned all the dogs in the world loose in Alaska, within 20 years, all you'd see is the wolf type body style, thick fur. If you turned all the dogs in the world loose in the desert, go back in 100 years, all you're going to find is, you know, thin fur, dingo, long legs, skinny body. They survive better in hot weather. The wolf survives better in cold weather. That not, that's not evolution. It's natural selection or artificial selection where somebody decides, I want brown cows or white cows. Either way, you're selecting a pre-existing gene code. So to go from a few thousand animals, probably about 8,000 kinds on the ark. Keep in mind, Noah did not have to have fish on the ark. They had plenty of water outside, okay? He didn't have to have bugs on the ark. Insects, they don't breathe through their nostrils. They could survive on floating log mats and dead carcasses. But the, about 8,000 kinds of animals is the current estimate from bearmanology.com. Those 8,000 animals turning into all the varieties today, not a problem. Turning from a rock into all the ones today, big problem.
All right. Thank you for that response there, Kent. Much appreciated. And Ryan, we'll hand it over to you if there's anything you'd like to add. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's a good question and it it's, you're wrong on that. I mean, even if you don't call them species, the variations, whatever you want to call them, if you started from those 8,000, uh, you would have up to eight to 11, 12, every single day, new variations being discovered and found. I mean, this would be a big event. This would be something that people would notice, but they didn't because it didn't happen like that. So yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you don't get millions of species from, or variations or kinds or whatever you want to call them from thousands on the ark. It just doesn't happen because it didn't happen. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. And Kent, question was for you. You get the last word. No, I think that's fine. I, I, I have to watch the video when we get to heaven and see how it happened, but I, I don't think that's a problem to go from thousands to uh, millions of what we have now decided to classify as species. The animals don't care how we classify them. Turn all the animals loose in the woods. The dogs seek out the dogs to mate with, not the pine trees or the porcupines. They know. We might not know if it's the same kind. They know. And like my wife so brilliantly said recently, the, how did that fish know to find the female of his kind? He doesn't even know what he looks like. How does he know what she looks like? He's got eyes going this way. He's never seen himself, never seen a mirror. But they know. Tell you what, turn all the animals loose. The sheep, sheep seek out the sheep. They don't look for the cows to mate with. Don't even think about them. So I think they know what the same kind are. And to produce all the kinds from a few thousand on the ark, I don't see a problem with that. But I'm not asking that be taught at my taxpayer's expense. Okay, Ken, thank you so much for that final word. Next question comes in from Patty Smith, $10 Super Chat. Thank you for the support and question. This one is for you, Ryan. So Patty's asking, Seleucus, hopefully I said that right, are the oldest dog breeds and closest genetically to wolves. Why can you easily breed nearly any dog from Seleucus, but using only Seleucus offspring, you cannot turn them back to wolves? Why is this? Um, well, that, I mean, that's kind of a, you could ask that with any animal. I mean, to turn it back into something that it was, I guess you could with enough time and enough of the, you know, going back to wolves again. But again, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Like I said, I'm not an expert on any of this. I'm really not. And I, I'll never make the claim that I am. So yeah, I, I don't know. It's interesting and I'll look into it and then probably even make a video about it. But yeah, other than that, I don't know. Sorry. Okay, Ryan, appreciate the response. And looks like it's pronounced Saluki. So thanks to Grayson in the chat. And uh, over to Kent, if you had anything to add. Kent, the floor is yours. No, I don't. I, I don't. Yeah, I'm not in dog breeding kind of stuff. I let them breed themselves. But uh, the Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind. That's all we've ever seen. The Chihuahua, Great Dane are obviously the same kind. I mean, it's in there 24 times in the first seven chapters. They're going to bring forth the same kind, the same sort. And that's, that's, that's science. That's surreal science. That's anything else is not science. Okay. Appreciate it. Kent, Ryan, did you want a quick final word since it was for you? Uh, yeah, I guess. I'm sure. I don't, I want to say, I don't think you could get back to a wolf. You could get maybe back to a dog like creature that's has some wolf traits and they're closer to a wolf, but I guess, uh, yeah, I just don't see that working. But again, sorry if I didn't answer that adequately. I'm not an expert, so. Okay, no worries. Ryan, thanks so much. Next question comes in for Pseudonym. And appreciate it. Looks like this question is for Kent. Um, I've got it up on screen. I guess we'll read it together here. Why are there snow leopards, polar bears, penguins, and kangaroos found in specific regions... Like, did they hold hands and survived off Noah's Ark despite distance? So I guess, why is this the case, uh, Dr. Hoven? Go ahead. Well, uh, I think animals tend to hang out with their own kind. Uh, the leopards like to hang out with leopards. And they don't like to hang out with, uh, coyotes don't like to hang out with donkeys, that's for sure. They send them flying. So I think that there are, uh, they, getting off the Ark, they would tend to go with their own kind. If you watch my video number six on my series, I cover very carefully about the animals spreading out from Noah's Ark, if the ice caps were larger on the planet, which obviously they were at one time, there were ice caps clear down to Kansas City, Missouri, nobody argues with that. If the ice caps are bigger, that means the oceans are smaller because the water's frozen, stuck on the poles. If the oceans are smaller, all the continents are connected just by the continental uh, shelf. If you lowered the ocean about 40 feet, and it's 12,000 feet deep, 
If you took 40 feet of water or 100 feet of water out of the ocean and froze it, you could walk to Australia from, your, from Asia. So because the land bridge in there, underwater land bridge. So just Google uh, continental shelf and take a look. You'll see it. It's obvious that the oceans were smaller in the past because the continents were because everything was frozen on the poles. So I think there's not a problem at all to claim that uh, the animals could get around the world in the first few hundred years, or maybe a thousand years after the flood, while the ice melted back and slowly raised the level. Okay, thank you, Kent. Uh, Ryan, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, they didn't, obviously. They just, you know, evolved or into different species, kinds, variations, whatever words you want to use, and evolved at that in that area because of its surroundings and environments. I would like to know if the uh, the latter, the other option is true. The whole they spread out from a single point from an arc. Why there's no evidence of that at all? There's no you know bodies along the way. I guess they all made it in one stretch, didn't die. I don't know. Seems unlikely, but we'll see. We'll see. Okay, Ryan, thank you. Kent, if there's a final word you wanted to make, question was for you. Go ahead. No, that's going to be a great video to watch in heaven, how they spread out around the world. And I'll try to get the message down to Ryan, how it happened. I like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Kent. Uh, okay. Next question comes in from Paper Bag Man. Question for Ryan. And he's asking, let's see here. Can you refute Kent's point about the moon being too close or the earth spinning too fast if the earth is billions of years old? Ryan, what are your thoughts? Definitely would need to, I would like to look into it a little better, but just off the top of my head, you know, the acceleration rate would be one thing. It's not going to be moving as fast away from the earth the entire time. Even if it was, people just aren't comprehending distance correctly and scale and time. And it doesn't, I mean, again, I don't know for sure. I can't refute it great in detail scientifically or nothing like that. As I've said many, many times, not an expert in, I would personally, though, like to look into this and figure it out for myself. So, you know, I will eventually. Okay, Ryan, thank you for the response there. And to Paper Bag Man, thanks for the question. Kent, over to you if you had anything to add. Well, I think he needs to argue with NASA. NASA has said very clearly they've studied it carefully as anybody. They want to go land on that big rock up there. And they think the moon is receding uh, 3.8 centimeters or almost an inch and a half, over half an inch and a half a year. And they did the recession rate and said, wow, 1.2 billion max. Oh, well, forget that. We know it's billion. We know it's 4.6, so forget it. No, let's not forget it. Let's not, let's not bypass evidence that goes against your religion. The evidence is clear. You can't have billions of years. I know you need it, but you can't have it. Scientifically, not available. If I said this ink pen is 10,000 years old, it would be easy to refute that. Very easy. I don't know, I don't know when it was made. I don't care, but it's not 10,000. I could easily refute this pen, <coughs> this pen being 10,000 years old, easily. I could easily refute the Earth being billions of years old. That doesn't prove it's 6,000, but it ain't billions, that's for sure. The salt in the ocean, the spin of the Earth, the moon, the population of the Earth. There's all kinds of scientific indicators that say it can't be billions. Sorry, you can't have it. <coughs> Okay, Kent, thanks for that response. Ryan, if you wanted a quick final word, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, as I've said, I don't know a lot about this. I do know for a fact that NASA didn't say that. It, but anyway, sorry that I don't know, again, a lot about it, but I will look into it. Okay, thank you so much there, uh, Ryan. And we're going to start wrapping it up here now that we hit the 90-minute mark with uh, one or two more questions. So let's see here. I'll make sure to pick the most on-topic ones. This one comes in from Michael Diaz. For Kent's opponent, so for you, Ryan, where does the new information come from? By what mechanism can mutations create additional building code? Yeah, so try to answer the best I can. New information is simply just a mutation. That's all it is. It's changing a, you know, T to a G, A to a C, whatever. Um, so it to say where it comes from is kind of a weird way to look at it, but it's usually there's natural selection, obviously one of the more prominent and popular ones, but there's also artificial selection, all sort, all different forms of evolution, but it, it, it just, it changes very, very, like just a very minimal, small change that basically means nothing, but over a long time, they do add up to something. So where does it come from? 
uh, could just depends on what you know organism or creature we're talking about. But and what is it? What mechanisms can mutations create additional building code? Ah, I don't know. Sorry, I'll look more into it again, like most things. All right, thanks for the answer there, uh, Ryan and Kent. Over to you. An amoeba <clears throat> does not have a heart, brain, lungs, pancreas, arms, blood vessels, skin, hair. There's trillions of things amoebas do not have. There's a whole lot of information, or, or protozoa, or bacteria, whatever you want, okay? They don't have any of that. To change from a single-celled creature to all these features that we have today uh, and claim it is science is ludicrous. I'm sorry. It's not science. That's a great question. Where did the information come from to change your protozoa or whatever you want to start with into all these things today? I'd like to know that also. I don't think there's an answer other than just imagine over billions of years. It's all you have. Imagination, Ryan. I feel sorry for you. Thank you, Kent. Ryan, if you wanted a quick final word, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, hold on. I will screenshot this question real quick uh, and find it out. And I next debate, if I'm you know, lucky or fortunate enough to come back and debate you, Mr. Hoven, I'll have a better exactly. answer for you. But yeah, it's it does happen. I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. You believe in evolution as well. You believe in a very rapid form of it. So regardless of where it comes from or all that, it, things evolve. There's no question about that. No question. Okay, gentlemen, final question for the night. Great debate. And uh, to the audience, lots of excellent questions. So I appreciate you guys being so engaged in this always fun topic, evolution on trial. So Mark or Mike Corleone, question for Ryan. What part of evolution is scientifically provable and how? Yeah, so part of evolution i mean evolution is a scientific theory and it's a process in which things evolve things change that that happens even if you can't observe all the way from billions of years ago something changing into something today blah blah and yes i know dogs don't produce non-dogs and all that but it, it, things do evolve everything evolves it's not just life like everything in our lives evolves inanimate and alive and i don't I don't know how scientifically to prove, you know, a particular part of it. I'm sorry. As I've said, I'm not an expert. But the thing is, the other option is, is just, I don't I just don't get how that's better. I mean, that's just ridiculous. You're going by a book written 2000, whatever so years ago that was mistranslated and misinterpreted so many different times by different generations of humans, and then relying on it to base your entire worldview around instead of a scientific process. But I don't know. Thank you, Ryan. Kent, over to you. Oh, oh Kent, Kent, I think you might be on mute. There. There you go. There you go. Okay. There we go. Ryan, you're basing your entire worldview on a bunch of humans who believe they came from a rock slowly over billions of years. I don't think that's common sense either. Okay. Uh, so the what is observable is variations within the kind. Unfortunately, someone choose to, chose to call that microevolution, and that he's hung up on that word evolution, and he's going to cling to that. Oh, look, here's evolution. Therefore, it's all true. I think it's true that all the potatoes had a common ancestor. I don't think it's true that you have an ancestor with potatoes. Now, you can believe that, but that's not science. So what is observable is potatoes produce potatoes. Humans produce humans. That's observable. It is not observable to say anything else, is and it's not part of science. It's polluting our science. I want to be the hero and come along and rescue science from this dangerous contamination that has crept in called evolution. It's a contamination. It's a religious cult, nothing more. Thank you very much, Kent. And this was the final question. And the question was for you, Ryan. We'll give you the final word if you'd like it. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> so you want to be the hero and save it all. I mean, you haven't done it in 30, 40 years yet, but maybe one day. So, yeah, I got really nothing else to add to it. Just uh, thanks again for having me, and I'm sure we'll be wrapping up here. So, Okay, Ryan and Dr. Hoven, that wraps up the audience Q&A and the debate. So we've endured to the end. It's been a fantastic debate, very lively discussion. And so uh, before we completely wrap it up, let's just have some quick final words, final thoughts. Ryan, that kind of sounded like that was your, your quick final word, final thought. If you wanted to add anything, go ahead. Then we'll hand it to Kent. 
No, no, just, you know, thanks again. I always appreciate coming and it, it is always fun. I, you know, always learn something interesting. That's for sure. All right. Well, my pleasure. These debates are always uh, some of the more fun debates, evolution on trial. So thank you again, Ryan, for being willing to engage in this topic. And Kent, over to you. Thank you as well for your time tonight. Quick final words, final thoughts. Go ahead. Well, uh, one thing for sure, we're all going to die. You're going to be dead for a long time, real long time. George Washington died over 220 years ago. He's still dead. You're going to die one day. Where are you going? Smoking or non-smoking? Choice is up to you. I'm going to die one day. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do. I've been working real hard to make it the last thing I do, but so far I'm work working out. But I'm going to die, and I want to take what this little life I've got and use it for the Lord. I'd like to challenge Christians. What are you doing for the Lord with your life? If you're not a Christian, why not? Who made you? Why would you think you made yourself over billions of years from an amoeba? Why would, why would anybody believe such a thing? We have videotapes. We've got all kinds of stuff. You can get my videos, watch them, send them back, get your money back. We're not in this for the money. If you want to buy a set of tapes, buy them, watch them, copy them, then send them back, get your money back. It's always been our policy. We want to help. We want to see everybody get saved and come to heaven, give their heart to the Lord. So that's our goal. It's called drdino.com, 855-BIG-DINO. I'm extension three. If you want to talk to me, if you want to order our tapes, go to extension one. Come visit Dinosaur Adventure Land in Lenox, Alabama. Ryan, you're invited. I'll give you the tour. Okay, awesome. Thanks for those final words. Final thoughts, uh, Kent, and also uh, to Ryan. Thanks for an excellent debate. To the audience, thanks for tuning in. And we are going to wrap it up here. I'm going to let the debaters out. As usual, I'll stick around for two minutes going over some announcements and reminders. So I'll be back. But to the debaters, thanks again. God bless. All right, there we go. Another one in the books. And I want to thank everybody in the audience. We had a ton of excellent questions. We always uh, get a lot of awesome questions for these uh, for these shows. We are so close to December. This uh, Evolution Debate Challenge series, it has been prolific. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, when me and Kent discussed it at the end of 2021 and then basically put out the challenge in uh, 2022, in January. Um, I don't think we realized we'd be getting this many debates, but it has been it has been a ton of fun, a series to remember. I think now you can look on the website, check the playlist. We've done about 50 in just the Evolution Debate Challenge series. We've incorporated, uh, though, debates on, you know, the age of the earth, the global flood, so on and so forth, where I've engaged in this series, endogenous retroviruses, for example. I've done a number of debates on that, uh, considering I've written a book on it, which you can see behind me, and also pick up on the website or uh, even in the description box of this video. Uh, we've also had Professor David McQueen, our uh, team geologist. He's engaged in this debate. As a matter of fact, he'll be back here on, I believe, December 14th, he'll be debating Ryan Adler on the feasibility of Noah's Ark. So that should be fun. Uh, debates on Noah's Ark are always, a, it's a hot topic. So I'm looking forward to that one. And uh, we've got, for December, we've got several uh, more debates in the Evolution Debate Challenge series. So in the coming week or two, you should see me post those uh, for December. I've got about between, I think, 10 to 12 events that I'm going to be fitting into uh, December and January. I've got a lot of the thumbnails good to go for them, so I'll probably be setting them in the next couple days. And we are going to end the year with a bang, I got to say. Uh, we've now ho hosted close to 250 debates, 250 debates. So perfect for all the debate addicts out there. I love debates, and we've got debates on all sorts of topics. Theology, soteriology, nature of God, creation, evolution, ancestry, eschatology, a little bit of everything for you. Ashley Myers, thank you so much. Uh, sister, she says, I have been enjoying your Dawn of the Antichrist book and your eschatology series. So you can see it behind me. We've got a full color and also a uh, black and white. Let me put it in the chat for everybody. Um, 
in my last show that I did yesterday for my eschatology series, I think I'm up to 17 or 18 videos now in that series that includes a formal debate I did with JD Morin, as well as an open mic a debate that we hosted me and Kent and Matt were here for that. Um, so check out that series, but I notified anybody that has bought in the book. It's a blessing to see that so many have picked up the book. They've enjoyed it. They say they're blessed from it. I've actually had emails from people saying, and praise the Lord, all the glory to God. People who said that they were, you know, pre-tribulation rapture for years and years. But after reading the book, watching the series and enjoying these debates, they have now converted to the pre-wrath position. So praise the Lord, seeing lots of fruit. And that truly is a blessing. So let me put in the chat uh, for anybody who's uh, looking to purchase the book. Uh, I kind of trailed off there a little bit, but what I wanted to say is what I was saying in uh, yesterday's show. Anybody who's bought in the book, they have a physical copy. Uh, feel free to reach out and I'll send you a PDF as well, because I know a lot of people uh, also like to have a computer version. And so um, I can send you that. And I've gotten a lot of emails just in the last 24 hours, and I've been on top of it. I've been. Um, sending out the PDF. So here is the, I'm going to post it. Um, Doki Doki Bible Club. Thank you so much, brother. Good to have you back. The party doesn't start till Doki Doki walks in. So good to see you. Appreciate all the help. Um, especially, you know, any help is, is helpful. I guess you could say as, as the more we grow in this ministry, you know, I've got just requests after requests coming in every single day through the website for debates, for shows. I'm also working now to um, set some more interviews and presentations on, you know, creation versus evolution, some open mics on, uh, you know, Trinity versus oneness. There's so much possibility in terms of what we can host in 2023. You know, I want to do open mics and shows again on, you know, the nature of God, specifically Trinitarian theology versus oneness theology, eschatology, more on creation versus evolution. I've got a debate coming up on creation versus evolution with Grayson. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. That's kind of my main focus currently in terms of study. Uh, trying to balance your eschatology, soteriology, and science-related topics. So again, to anybody interested, I just posted the black and white version. Uh, that's cheaper because printing costs are cheaper when it's black and white. The full color edition, we basically got priced at cost because printing costs with Amazon Publishing is um, it's pretty high when it comes to the color. But anyways, we do have a color version. And so if you want to pick that up, it's really only a few dollars more than the black and white version. I want to make it affordable so as many people as possible can get this book and uh, see its content because it really does elaborate on a lot of the uh, points and arguments and teachings that I've provided in the series so far. So here's the full color edition. And somebody asked what a PDF is. A PDF is basically the book but in computer format. So you can pull it up on your computer, you can pull it up on your phone, and you can read it right from your computer and phone rather than having the physical copy. So a lot of people prefer that, especially if they're you know looking for citations. For example, in my slideshow presentations, I've got a lot of, um, I cite a lot of quotation sources, excerpts from books. So I always like to have the ebook or the PDF because I can copy and paste certain excerpts when I'm citing the material. So. Um, again, I believe I've uh, posted that in the chat. You can also pick up this one I highly recommend. So this one I'm probably going to be updating again soon because in the world of creation, evolution, especially ancestry, every week there's new papers coming out. I mean, it really is a great time to be a biblical creation, especially in the world of genetics. I mean, there's always new papers coming out, new evidence coming to light, new information coming to light. So my goal is to keep this the most up-to-date book on ancestry out there. And I truly believe it is. And I will, I will um, continue expanding it, revising it as more information comes in. So it's about 300 pages, special creation, dismantling evolution, confirming independent origins. And as you can see on the back, you're going to get um, information on topics like chromosome 2 fusion, endogenous retroviruses, pseudogenes, nested hierarchies, you know, the hominid fossil record. Molecular clocks, mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosome Noah, junk DNA. Um, did I miss anything? Out of Africa versus out of Middle East. So this is, you're going to get a little bit on of everything on this. 
tons of citations in it. Um, you know, you've got a whole section in the back listing uh, papers that you can look to. And, uh, you know, papers from 2022 going over the molecular clock data that basically confirms mitochondrial Eve and uh, Y chromosome Noah. So um, anyways, let me go over a couple shows. Thank you, everybody, for the support. Also, uh, shout outs to anybody whose super chats I didn't get to. I appreciate the support. Since the evolution on trial debates are limited, we try and wrap them up around the two hour mark. I have to get to the questions that basically are as on topic as possible. So with the comments themselves, I do want to give a shout out. G Moose, thank you so much for the super chat and support there. Also born 100 years late. Thank you for the support. God bless you. And Ryan Daniel, thank you as well. He says, thank you to Standing for Truth and Dr. Kent and Ryan for conducting this debate for us this evening. Yes, this was a ton of fun. One of my favorite topics, you know, I'm addicted to the evolution debates for sure. Okay. So, um, yeah, we may just make that happen. You know, maybe, uh, Ryan and myself, I wouldn't mind doing a debate with him. Uh, you know, maybe we'll pick a topic, speciate post flood speciation, something like that. So, uh, but I do have a debate coming up round two with Grayson. Grayson, I'm looking forward to this. Round one was a ton of fun. Grayson's read my book there, Special Creation. He's put in the work. He's um, he's done a lot of study on this topic. And so he makes for a worthwhile debate. And so I'm looking forward to this. This one's technically round two. Round one was impromptu. So round two is going to be a little more formal, but informational nonetheless. So does genetics support universal or common ancestry? That is on December 6th. So uh, pure Aussie gold. Thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words. Um, Eunuch one. Thank you so much. God bless you as well. Centurion. Appreciate that. Uh, love the support. God bless you. You know, I'm very easy to find over Facebook. Obviously there's email too. Uh, I get a lot of emails every day. Sometimes I miss them or take me a few days to get to, but any questions that you have, regarding um any of the books that we sell especially the ones that i've personally written like the the erv handbook special creation end times theology the independent origins handbook shoot me a question shoot me inquiries and i do the best that i can that i can to uh help you out so anyways the evolution debate challenge series continues this is going to be epic so the saga continues i didn't think we would get around for trilogy one completed months and months ago but um, the saga continues. So Wade the Wizard, Dr. Dino, they, uh, I got to say, their trilogy of debates there, it was, uh, it was, it rivals the Lord of the Rings trilogy. <laughs> but seriously, it was an entertaining trilogy, very engaging. Wade and, and Dr. Dino had some good moments. So saga continues on Wednesday. So uh, <laughs> Redefine Living, Wade and Redefine, they're best buds. So they went to separate high schools together. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Sam, I know you are as well. Uh, so that's going to be coming up on Wednesday. Wednesday. Today, of course, the Ryan Adler debate round two. And then we're, we're changing it up. We got some solid debates. Theology, for example, is theistic determinism biblical. Dan Chapa, CJ Cox. I've also got Dan Chapa and Joshua Gibbs. They're going to be debating free grace theology versus lordship salvation. Another one of my favorite topics. Always, um, We always get an excellent audience for those debates. So Dan and Josh Gibbs, they'll be debating in January. Uh, this one is theistic determinism biblical. Dan Chapa is going to be defending the Molinist, uh, the Molinism position. And so, you know, we've we've hosted almost 250 debates. I think this is the first time that we're going to have a debate on this specific topic, Molinism versus theistic determinism. So very cool. I'm looking forward to this one. This should be a lot of fun. Uh, we've got two heavyweights. This will be Clash of the Titans here. Uh, December debate, of course, since November is basically over. We're ending November with the Wade the Wizard versus Kent debate. Um, so another Lordship Salvation versus Free Grace Theology debate. Gotta love the Soteriology showdowns. Do all believers persevere? This is going to be on a Saturday. I believe it's going to be on, um, let me see if I'm not mistaken. I think it's September. Let's check here. I think September 10th. 
So it'll actually be a Saturday soteriology showdown. There we go. <laughs> Do all believers persevere? And so that'll be um, that'll be a lot of fun as well. Just looking at the chat here, make sure I've engaged and answered all the questions. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, okay, what do we? What else do we got? Oh, I'm pumped for this one. So this one um, is going to be this Friday. And so three epic debates this week, Ryan versus Kent round two, Wade versus Kent, the saga continues. And then we've got, this is going to be more of an informal debate. So this was my suggestion for this one, David Preston, Pastor Matt first. They both know their stuff on this topic, both well-studied uh, Pastor first. He's written a book on this topic called Who is Israel? And so this is going to be an informal debate. They'll both be having 10 to 12 minute opening statements. And then as moderator, I'm going to guide the discussion along. And we're also going to take audience questions and kind of mix those up within the discussion uh, itself. But we're going to be chatting about dispensationalism, replacement theology, the church and spiritual Israel. So who is true Israel? And it's going to come down to is true Israel, you know, spiritual Israel or physical Israel. And uh, both of these gentlemen here, they know their stuff. So this is going to be awesome. I've also got in January, I'm working on the final details. Pastor Matt first has written a book uh, debunking the pre-trib rapture. I believe it's called the pre-trib rapture versus the King James version of the Bible, something like that. And I've got another pastor named uh, Daniel Eldridge. I believe it is. He's written a book titled uh, Rightly Divided. That's going to be a formal debate. It's going to be a big one. So once I confirm the details and get that up, that's going to take place first first thing January, it looks like, judging by our back and forth communication as we set this debate up. It'll be a formal debate, Pastor Matt first versus Pastor Daniel Eldridge. So fingers crossed, let's get the final details on that one. That one's going to be huge. So we want 2023 to top 2022. It's it's not going to be easy, but I think we can do it if we all uh, you know put in the work and um, get some awesome debates going. So this one... Um, Coming up in the middle of December, Mark Gageton and Jeremy Nortier is the Lutheran doctrine of baptism biblical. So I've wanted to get a debate on this topic for a while and not just, you know, with any debaters. I wanted, you know, well-informed, educated debaters on this topic. And we got it. Jeremiah and Mark, they both know this topic extremely well. And this is going to be a formal debate. It's going to happen in December. I believe it's December 16th, but just make sure you're subscribed and that way you, you'll know the exact days and times for these debates because you are not going to want to miss these. Um, here's my debate coming up with Grayson, which I've already covered. And that's pretty much it for now that I've got um, set on the channel. And just look at the channel over the next week. I'll be setting another roughly 10 shows, okay? Uh, Boomer 21. Let me see here. I'm looking at the, um, you know, I don't see it saved for some reason. So I apologize. Boomer 21, tell you what, for Wednesday, you get a free question. So don't send him in a super chat Wednesday for Wade versus Kent. Just send in a normal question. I'll put it to the top of the list. My apologies. These debates, especially the evolution debate, um, the evolution on trial debates, the chat's flying. I'm controlling the audio of the debaters, you know, I'm moderating, especially in these free flowing discussions. So unfortunately I do apologize. I do miss uh, some of the questions, which is why it's always awesome to have a guest mod too once in a while for these. So, okay. With that being said, Boomer 21, you get a, a free question on Wednesday. So make sure you're here, Kent versus Wade, and I'll put your question, um, right to the top. So that's about it. Let me look at the chat real quick. And okay, well, God bless. I hope everybody had as much fun as I did for this debate. Uh, if you're new to the channel, but you love debates, share this content around, share the channel around to friends and family. We're so close to hitting 12,000 subscribers. We're almost at 11.9 thousand, but it'd be nice to hit that 12,000 uh, even by, even by January, you never know it's possible. So anyways, God bless all. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you again on Wednesday and for any of our books, any of our material and content, check the website out, standingfortruthministries.com or in the description box of this video, I've got it. I've got all the necessary links for you too. So with that being said, Donnie is out. God bless all.